broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. All right. Welcome, everyone, to today's Title Topics webinar. These are ALTA's free presentations we offer every month on issues important to uh, title professionals. I am Jeremy Yowie, also as Vice President of Communications, and today we've got a uh, fantastic webinar lined up to uh, help you understand the common endorsements used for uh, commercial transactions. And uh, apparently uh, this was a pretty popular topic as we had nearly uh, 1,300 people register for today's webinar and looks like I've got a lot of you still logging in. Uh, so we'll, we'll do a little bit of housekeeping before we get into the meat of the presentation. Um, uh, a few of the housekeeping items, a uh, copy of today's uh, presentation can be downloaded from the uh, go to webinar handout section. Um, all participant lines are muted for today's presentation. Um, if you have a question, uh, please submit them through the question box. We'll hold a little bit of time for Q&A at the end of the presentation. Um, just a reminder, as an extra benefit, the, uh, the webinar is recorded. After we've got it edited, the recording will be available on Alta's website at alta.org forward slash title topics. That's alta.org forward slash title topics. And you'll all get an email actually with a direct link to the recording as well. Uh, I need to thank Fidelity National Title Group for sponsoring our Title Topics webinars this year. Um, this support allows us to uh, continue providing these uh, opportunities free of charge. And uh, with that out of the way, uh, please let me introduce today's speakers. Uh, first, we have David Heron. David is the National Marketing Director at National Due Diligence Services. Uh, David has spoken on this uh, topic at several AALTA events the, uh, the past few years. And also joining us is Stephanie Bang. Uh, Stephanie is underwriting counsel for Fidelity National Title Group. And uh, with that, David, I'll turn the presentation over to you. All right, great. Thank you very much, Jeremy. It's a pleasure to be kind of back with you again, and I hope you can all bear with my southern slang, my southern drawl, if you will. Some of you that may have been on the residential versus commercial webinar not too long ago, uh, may recognize my voice a little bit, but I use that to my advantage. So I'm a, you know, University of Georgia Bulldog, so, you know, go SEC. So now that that's out of the way, <laughs> I want to um, make sure, hang on just a second, let me get my slides working here. There we go. Um, so, yeah, I am David Heron, National Marketing Director for National Due Diligence Services. We are a division of American Surveying and Mapping, Inc., um, we are national land surveyor and professional due diligence firm, so we do handle more than title-related items. Uh, we do the environmental reports, property condition, et cetera. So I've got pretty extensive background in the full commercial transaction. Um, we were established uh, over 25 years ago and frankly are the nation's largest private sector survey firms, which, which simply means that we utilize our own surveyors in most cases. Um, we sub very little work um, when we have to. It's generally due to volume or time pressures. Um, and we've got a staff of over 150 dedicated and experienced professionals that handle the uh, uh, throughout the nation. Um, Stephanie Bang, who has been so nice to be able to come on board and uh, talk with us today, uh, she is underwriting counsel for the Fidelity National Title Group. She's based out in LA. It is a current uh, state bar of uh, California. Um, and we're just really happy to have her on. So, Stephanie, can you say hi to everyone? Hello, everyone. There you go. Thank you very much. I also want to make mention of Cindy Jared. She is my senior vice president of handling national accounts for me. A lot of uh, years in the business itself, and frankly, she's very active in Alta and really ran point in building this relationship that we've had with Alta in sponsoring a lot of their events and speaking for some of the various uh, events as well. Also, Brett Moskovitz, he is our president and CEO of American Surveying and Mapping and NDDS um, and has been in the business forever. And frankly, the biggest thing about Brett is that he has really helped uh, create and establish many best business practices for streamlining not only the land surveying business, but also the due diligence services business on a national platform. Um, so I, I wanna, we're going to touch on these various items today, certainly the common commercial title endorsements. So we're going to talk a little bit about the role of title insurance, um, ALTA and endorsements, and kind of how that relationship works. Uh, the purpose of an endorsement, some of these are very elementary, so we'll touch on them briefly. 
Um, some of the state regulations, whether promulgated or, uh, or filed uh, uh, states, um, uh, various types of endorsements. Um, we are going to discuss very specific endorsements. And when I mention the specific endorsements, my expertise is not in endorsements, however, uh, in loan policy endorsements. And that's why I have Stephanie on the line with us. Um, coming from the survey title related background that we deal with day in and day out, I will be touching fairly heavily on those survey and title related endorsements that are uh, common to both an owner's policy as well as the loan policy. So I'll talk in terms of the Alta Land Survey and the title related endorsements, and then Stephanie will help us a lot with the uh, uh, getting information on some of the loan, specifically the loan policy endorsements. So let's start with this. Um, the Alta, you know, what is that relationship between Alta and endorsements? So really, the American Land Title Association is not really a state or a federal regulator. They're just a trade association that represents the title insurance industry that helps, obviously, them bring about certain standards. Um, but they simply promulgate endorsements. And really, the definition of promulgate is really to promote or to make them widely known or to pro proclaim or put them into effect. So no one is actually obligated to use any of the endorsements, although most states do. Um, one primary exception would be Texas. It uses kind of its own set, but frankly, um, Texas, um, a lot of the Texas and Alta endorsements mirror one another. Texas may take it a step further or go a little bit deeper into the, to the actual um, uh, endorsement itself and have a little more diversity within the versions. But, and you need to know this, um, not all states provide all title policy endorsements. So Florida is a good example in that it does not provide zoning endorsements or access endorsements. Uh, California has CLTA, which has equivalent ALTA endorsements that are a little bit separate, each of those being uh, promulgated states. Same thing with New Mexico. So. Um, so there are states out there that you will most certainly want to speak with your state, your local underwriters within whatever title company you use uh, to be able to find out which endorsements are available and which are not. If they are not, oftentimes they will be able to recommend one that may cover something similar to or take care of your at least your needs. Um, it's the McCarran-Ferguson Act that really provided that state law shall govern the regulation of insurance under the various state insurance departments. Some states are filed form states where the endorsement forms must be filed and approved by the state insurance department. But just know this, most of the ALTA forms are the standard nationally. Um, and even though other states may offer or not offer certain endorsements, oftentimes they will rely on or, or, or mirror that, that ALTA uh, endorsement. Now, the policy itself is really, you know, you've got your owner's policy and you've got your loan policy, but they all still contain three main parts, the insuring clauses, the exclusions from coverage, and then any conditions to the policy. So really, it's a contract where the title company indemnifies the insured against events covered under the insuring clauses, subject to any exclusions, as well as any stated conditions. So that's what it does. Now, the endorsement is simply an amendment or a change or an alteration or a deletion or any kind of a deviation from the basic stated uh, standard coverage. So, and this is simply accomplished by deleting or amending any exclusions uh, uh, or conditions within the policy itself. As I mentioned, there are two types of policies, the loan policy, which really does protect the lender's investment and their collateral and an owner's policy that would protect that buyer or owner of any future discovery of ownership issues. Um, I'm going to start off by talking a little bit about the title and survey related endorsements because frankly they are common to both the owner's policy as well as the loan policy and so and and it's certainly a little more in my range of expertise so I'll start in this in this arena but as far as the survey exceptions are concerned the purpose of the title is to exclude from coverage issues that would be revealed not by the search of public records, but only by really boots on the ground, actual measurements, GPS work by an accurate survey 
uh, with a professional land surveyor signing and sealing that, uh, that document at the end of the day. Um, there's certainly exception when there's no survey coverage is given, and there will be detailed exceptions for even specific matters that are shown on the survey, such as perhaps encroachments or things of that nature. So we're going to take a look at the ALTA survey and do a quick, um, just take a look at it, see some of the review techniques, if you will, and we're going to pay particular attention to, you know, to, to some of the things that it applies because the survey in the commercial world does utilize the ALTA survey standards, and this is and the ALTA uh, slash NSPS, the National Society of Professional Surveyors. So there is a set of standards that sets the scope of work and the boundaries and guidelines for an ALTA survey. One of the key elements to provide to, to receiving an endorsement is to assure that the legal description matches the legal description on the title insurance policy. If there are any differences, you must so state on the face of the land survey itself. You will also need to depict all possible encroachments into easements, setbacks, and any boundary uh, lines uh, with adjoining properties. We, will, we, are, we are bound to uh, depict all easements, depict all improvements, buildings, asphalt, parking, et cetera, on the property itself. And then, in most cases, zoning matters. Whether if it conforms to current zoning, what are the setbacks for zoning, what are the, what's the parking ratio, et cetera, the height, square footage, et cetera. And there's specific endorsements that apply to the zoning matters, but we relate and integrate the zoning information into the ALTA land survey. This is simply the really the first page of the ALTA standards where it says, when asked to ensure title to land, without exception as to the many matters which might be discoverable from survey and inspection and which are not evidenced by public records. So boots on the ground, physically looking at it, field verification, that's what the survey is going to do. This is just an example of an ALTA survey, one of, one of our formats that are done, in fact, in, in kind of color-coded so that we show possible encroachments, which are highly reviewable. They're also highly endorsable items, if you will, or lack of or excluded from coverage. We do those in red. The Schedule B2 items from your title commitment, which will address any plottable um, uh, easement access, right-of-ways, things of that nature. We do have a format that, uh, that, that makes those easements access easy to, easy to find. The title commitment, all these elements come in red on our surveys because they are highly reviewable and we want you to be able to see it fairly quickly. Legal description, again, another highly reviewable item on an ALTA survey. So we will indicate that always in, in blue on our surveys, again, for ease of, uh, of review, as well as any surveyor's notes and certifications and things of that nature. So I just wanted you to kind of take a look at the survey, the layout of the survey, and some of the key elements that are reviewable with each and every ALTA survey in order to receive endorsements. Now, um, I'm going to run down this real quick, and we're going to get into more specifics of these items. But these are the primary endorsements that we're going to talk about today. Uh, Stephanie's not really going to touch. She's going to touch on the ALTA 9 series, but I will. But we're going to cover the ALTA 9 because it has really been known as the comprehensive. Uh, uh, endorsement out there. And uh, I'm going to let her go into some, some much more detail with that a little bit later in the presentation, but that's certainly probably the most common endorsement that we see, and it does relate directly to the ALTA survey. We're also going to talk about the survey coverage, ALTA 25, access coverage, uh, zoning coverage, as well as uh, contiguity. So we will be addressing all of those uh, a little bit later, and as I said, I'm going to be talking about these as they relate to the survey. Stephanie be, will be touching on the, the, really the loan policy. So comprehensive endorsements are the most commonly requested endorsements out there, and originally these combined several common endorsements into a single endorsement, and this involves coverage for this involved coverage for encroachments violations of any covenants, conditions, or restrictions, and any damages for mineral production. So ALTA ultimately revised the ALTA 9 into six separate sections to help define that coverage a little more clearly. Uh, clearly. 
Well, once done, this then required two additional endorsements. They broke out part of it and added ALTA 28, which addressed encroachment, and added ALTA 35 for the enforced removal uh, for mineral, uh, mineral production. So with that being said, I really kind of want to turn this over to Stephanie to kind of expand upon some of these a little bit and to give us a little more detail about when and why the ALTA 9 came to be. So Stephanie, can you help us here? Yes, uh, so um, prior to 2012, ALTA 9, ALTA 9 uh, provided broad coverage for loss sustained by reason of a CCNR, under which a lien of, or due to, uh, lien of due to trust can be subordinated or extinguished, violations of CCNRs, um, existing improvements that violate a setback lines, encroachments onto adjoining parcels, encroachment onto the land of structures from adjoining parcels, and private rights and et cetera. So it was very broad. And then um, it was revised in 2012 after the Third Circuit's decision in Nationwide Life Insurance Company versus Commonwealth Land Title Insurance Company. And it involved a case where Commonwealth had insured um, Franklin Mills Mall in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And the property had a, a deed restriction requiring the prior owner's approval of any sales. And the current owner wanted to sell to a buyer who wanted to turn the mall into a, a technical school. And um, the prior or, uh, owner refused um, for it to be changed. And so the owner made a claim. Commonwealth denied it because it had, uh, under the ALTA 9 endorsement, it, it, its contention was that the deed restriction was accepted from um, the ALTA 9. But the district court and the circuit court of appeals had a different reading of the ALTA 9 because the ALTA 9, uh, the way it was drafted back then, it said it needed to have uh, expressly accepted, whether it be the private rights or um, setbacks, restriction, or whatever, um, in the specific instrument. So citing the instrument wasn't sufficient. You have to actually point out that there was a setback or a um, or uh, deed restriction on regarding sale in that instrument. So after that, uh, ALTA 9 was um, um, was reformed so that it um, instead of, of uh, stating that the exception from coverage is based on based on um, an instrument, now if you look at the ALTA 9, it actually says that. Um, uh, any uh, any uh, exceptions or encroachment listed, which it would be the ones that you get are listed from a survey, that is not covered by an ALTA 9. So um, it was revised to take out loss of priority or invalidity of the lien resulting from a private right. Now you have to get that from a 9.6. Um, and, uh, uh, and like I in, uh, uh, indicated, instead of listing the instrument, now it has an exception from coverage regarding encroachment that would be listed from a survey. Um, so it does still cover, it's still possible to get the same kind of coverage that's uh, prior to the change in 2012, but now you have to ask for the specific endorsement. Um, and that would mean moving, to and that would mean moving to, uh, to the Alpha 28 for specific encroachment? Yeah, so um, so the ALTA uh, 28 and the ALTA 9, they both have uh, similar coverage in, in the sense that it covers encroachment, but the ALTA 28 is a little bit more limited in the sense that um, ALTA 9, the definition of improvement covers um, the building, lawn, trees, shrubbery, whereas ALTA 28, it, it doesn't include that, and, and um, it also provides more control in terms of uh, for instance, um, if you want to ALK 28.1, you can itemize and exclude um, uh, particular encroachments you want to exclude from coverage. Um, or ALK 28.2, you can actually define what improvements you want to cover. Um, so basically, uh, the 28, it, it allows um, uh, the, either, either the customer or the title insurance company to pick and choose what they're willing to insure. So uh, uh, it's a little bit um, uh, uh, more uh, limited, but uh, it covers what what the customer wants. 
Got it. How about, how about out of 35? Yeah, how does that come into play? LT35 is similar also because uh, it has similar coverage um, as LT9 and 9.7, 9.10 regarding minerals. But again, it's the same thing as the 28 where um, the ALT35 is a little bit more uh, limited in the sense that it only covers the building. Um, the uh, 35.1 um, uh, defines improvement as the building and um, uh, paves roads walkway, parking area, driveway, or curb, and um, 35.2, again, allows you to specify and describe what the improvement actually is. Okay, and uh, enforced removal of improvements under construction. How, you, how does that play in? 35.3? Uh, right. Um, 35.3, 35.3, uh, improvement means existing building, structure, paved area, or curves, or there, those uh, 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 described in a certain plan. So if you want to get the uh, ALT 35.3, the customer actually has to provide um, what their plan is, which will have a survey, and based on the survey, um, um, and if we, after review by the town insurance of the survey, we'll be willing to ensure, give that endorsement or not for future improvements. Okay. Good point, and I think that you you struck on something there where you would be you would need to be supplied either a site plan since it's under construction. There may be a site plan. There may be a boundary survey that that, that may be addressed at this point, um, and then ultimately somewhere down the road there would be an as-built survey once improvements are on the property. Um, but you would need to in fact have that evidence, right? Yeah, the thirty-five point three. You can't get coverage for future improvements unless you have a plan because the plan is actually identified in the endorsement. Okay, got it. Very good. Thank you very much, Stephanie. Um, okay, so let's talk a little bit more about um, the survey-related uh, scenarios here, and in particular, the same as survey. Uh, and this is one of the main reasons, obviously, that uh, a client wants to do a, an ALTA survey. They want to remove the survey exception from the title policy, Insurers then want to issue an endorsement saying, which is a same as survey endorsement. And the thing you really need to look for is in fact that you need to make sure that the survey contains a statement on the face of the survey that the survey is the same property described in the title commitment. So on the face of the survey, you should look for that very specific statement and that is part of the uh, ALTA NSPS standards that we supply that if in fact that's the case. If it's not the case and we have found some differences, then we have to not only so state those differences, but also give you a legal description which we believe in fact to be accurate based on the boots on the ground, field verification uh, work that's been done. Um, so there are a couple of breakdowns. The same as survey endorsement, really it's just simply that legal description needs to match that title description as described in the endorsement. 25.1, if applicable, really uh, would simply uh, ensure uh, the same as a portion of the survey. Uh, of the survey, an example might be in case you're insuring a small pad site uh, in a large shopping center or something along those lines uh, uh, for same as survey. It's an important, very common endorsement out there, and you just need to be aware of it. Another is the um, the, the access endorsement now. Under the title policy, in, uh, and remember, these are both owners and lenders' policies would, 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 would show uh, both the same as survey as well as the access endorsement, if it's available in, in the state. It may not be available as, as it's not in uh, the state of Florida. Um, but you need to know that the legal access is insured, but the actual location and the quality of that access is not. So the lenders or owners often request additional coverage. Alpha 17 series is used for access coverage. Now, access by public right-of-way, 17-06, this provides coverage that the land does abut and has actual pedestrian and vehicular access to a designated public road, and that the road is physically open and right to use the existing curb cuts, if, if, if any, for the property itself. Um, 17.1, on the other hand, is indirect access and entry. So it's an access by easement, 
when the access does not physically touch a public roadway, but does have the right to across an adjoiner's property to be able to access the property. Then there's also the 17.2, which is a, really a utility access endorsement, and this would ensure the owner has access to very specific utilities uh, using the Alta survey, frankly, uh, in order to do so. Now, know this, um, Table A within the Alta standards, Item 11, addresses um, the utilities that need to be shown on the property itself. Now, the Alta standards now require an ALTA surveyor to indicate any above ground evidence of underground utilities. Now that doesn't mean he's going out with any underground radar scenarios and locating lines, um, but that may be a step that you might need to take in case, uh, depending upon what you're planning on doing with the property. Um, if we make an 811 call for, you know, before you dig ticket, then even then you need to be aware that that is only going to mark utilities or underground utilities that are within the right of way. They are not allowed to go onto the property itself. So, but this utility access endorsement would it would ensure that because you would in fact have access to a specific utility per that Alpha survey. So just watch your scope of work when ordering an Alpha survey and really define exactly what you need as far as the. Table A, item 11, which is uh, under the ALTA policy. Um, so, but, you know, it's uh, certainly key to the access coverage. Uh, contiguity. Now, this is kind of interesting because, you know, the owner and the lender want to be sure that two or, or more or multiple parcels that they own are taking a mortgage against um, are contiguous with no gaps, gores, or overlaps. Now, ALTA 19 is used where multiple parcels are insured under the policy that they are in fact abut one another or uh, uh, are, are contiguous. ALTA 19.1 is used where the insured wants to have coverage that a parcel that is insured by the policy is contiguous to a parcel that is not being insured under the policy. So you need to check when reviewing your ALTA land survey you need to make sure, once again, that there is a contiguity statement on the survey. So make sure that you request that the survey contain a statement that the parcels are contiguous to obtain title coverage. Now, you've noticed I've highlighted gaps, gores, or overlaps. I had mentioned this in one of my prior webinars, and I got a whole bunch of responses at the end of it after the webinar was over as to, I have no idea what a gore is. Many of you may think of a gore as being gored by a bull or something along those lines. Well, that doesn't have anything to do with it. So I thought I'd just kind of throw a slide in here that kind of explains a little bit about what the heck is a gore. So here's how it's kind of defined. In modern law and surveying, a gore is a strip of land, usually triangular in shape, as might have been left between surveys that do not close. Now remember, a gap, that's easy enough. It's a distance between two adjoining properties that no one actually owns, kind of a no man's land. If it is a, uh, an overlap, then you have two legal descriptions that in fact uh, um, encroach upon one another. So there's an issue with one or, the, or, or both legal description. The gore generally, is generally the result of errors when the land was very first surveyed and towns were laid out. And that gore would lie in an area between the two. Supposedly abutting towns would technically be in neither town. And here's just a good example. And you see this every day in your drive to work if you, if you take a freeway. A driving gore can occur when you are exiting or entering a ramp. I'm just showing my pointer here because you've got the highway running here. Well, that's not you. You've got a, you're entering the highway. This is you. And we see this gray car in the middle. He's in a gore. It's not really owned by you in this lane or owned by them in that lane. So it is a space that is in kind of a no man's land. Now, yes, boundary resolutions do occur in instances where a gore is overturned. But this is something that is not a public record, that does not show up in any recorded document, um, and can just be simply a strip of land or a triangular piece, which seems to be something that didn't immediately make sense by early, early surveyors. So I just thought I'd throw that out there at you as just kind of a little tidbit of information in case someone asks you. 
hey, what is a gore? Now you'll have some general idea. Okay, let's talk about zoning just a little bit. Um, this is coverage in the event the property is not properly zoned as stated on the endorsement and ensures the, pre the present use is permitted under current zoning ordinance. Um, most of these, the issuance of these endorsements is typically required uh, to have an independent zoning report or a zoning verification letter or some other planning department, uh, the local ordinance, uh, 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 the, the local municipality uh, ordinances. Um, there is ALTA 3, which is simply the unimproved land. So you're just simply making sure that the land is in fact permitted use under local zoning ordinances. The 3.1 endorsement further ensures that there is possibly uh, sufficient parking to satisfy the requirements of the applicable zoning endorsement. And 3.2 really does uh, ensure future use appropriately and make sure that it is appropriately zoned uh, for future use. But again, this comes back to endorsements typically available, et cetera. And you want to look at that zoning report, zoning verification letter, if you're looking for these endorsements. These uh, um, actually uh, relate directly to, again, the ALTA standards and one of the optional standards within the Table A items, which is items 6A and 6B, which ask you to, in fact, graphically depict uh, any setback lines or any, in front, any uh, uh, building height, landscaping height, signage height, things of that nature that may be evident on the property so that your uh, uh, building position and everything is in, is in accordance with, the, with all the zoning uh, regulations. So this would be something that you would want to add a Table A item 6A and B to your uh, scope of work for the ALTA land survey. Now this is the part where I am not as familiar. So I'm going to throw this a little bit to Stephanie. I'm kind of at her mercy to be able to kind of touch on a few of these things, but I will say this. We have had a couple of prior questions or, or pre-webinar questions that came in, particularly on the ALTA 29, but start at the top, if you would, uh, Stephanie, and just begin to kind of touch on, you know, the ALTA 20, the first loss, and some of these are very common. Uh, and if you happen to see or think of others that are more common, uh, then the ones I have noted here, by all means, comment on them. So I'll throw that to you, Stephanie. Okay. So um, the ALTA 20 is um, a first loss endorsement. So loss in title insurance is usually the difference in the value of the property with and without the title defects. So you usually do not know what the loss is until the property is sold or foreclosed. Um, so this endorsement allows the lender to make a claim without foreclosing when the loan is secured by multiple parcels. Um, it's not meant to be used for construction loans, um, but in terms of um, uh, trying to figure out what the loss is without having to foreclose, it does have a provision that the lender will pay back the title insurance company if there is a windfall. Um, the ALTA 22 is an endorsement that um, just ensures that a copy of the recorded um, plot or map that was attached to the exhibit um, reflects where the location and dimension of the land is. Um, so usually you'll get a survey for that to, to, to confirm that um, the property that's, in, that's being insured is where it's supposed to be. Um, right. <laughs> um, ALTA 27 is a, is a usury endorsement. Usury law in, in, in California is covered across various statutes such as the insurance code, the corporation's code, finance code. And generally, the usury rates for uh, consumer loans is 10%. For commercials, it's 5% above a rate set by, say, the Federal Reserve Bank. Um, unless the transaction... Hey, let me costs, ask you something, Stephanie. Let me interrupt just a minute. Is, is this something that is... Uh, I, I also know that Texas is, is, is not, uh, does not provide coverage for usury. And, and California does. And is it fairly common, uh, at least within your West Coast region? Yes, it is very common, um, uh, uh, but but it's but the it is very common in terms of getting the endorsement. Uh, we usually give it if it falls within um, an exemption from usury laws, and usually it means either the transaction itself is ex exempt or you're dealing with an exempt lender. 
Uh, for example, if the transaction is brokered by a loan broker, then it's considered exempt. Or if the lender is a type, a, a type of lender like a financial institution governed by state or federal laws, uh, credit unions, building and loan associations, those are all exempt lenders as well. Okay. Um, so if you fall under an exemption, we issue the endorsement. Um, okay, good. ALT 829 is an interest rate, rate swap agreement. And uh, this is generally when the lender is agreeing to fund the borrower's liability for interest in excess of a specified rate when a variable rate increases, whereas the borrower is required to pay the lender difference between the specified rate and the note rate if it drops below the swap rate. Uh, because you want to say that a little bit, say that a little bit slower, Stephanie. Because uh, so, we had a few questions regarding this, and I want to make sure that because uh, uh, I don't understand it, but and some may it, it, go a little slower. So the so the borrower gets uh, if the borrower uh, wants to get favorable interest rates, but otherwise wouldn't be qualified. Uh, unless it's under uh, interest rate swap, so they pay a, 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 a so there's there's like a, a there's interest rate where the lender thinks that the um, interest rate won't increase, whereas the borrower is 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 uh, thinking that it might increase or it won't get a, a better rate. So they agree to this where if the interest rate goes above it, the variable interest rate goes above it, then the lender is willing to pay that difference. Whereas uh, if it goes below that, the borrower will pay the lender the difference. Okay, uh, that makes more sense. Okay, thank you. <laughs> uh, because interest rate can go up and the lender liable for more than what the loan amount is, this endorsement ensures the lender against loss sustained by reason of the invalidity or unforceability or lack of priority of the insured, insured mortgage as security for the repayment of the swap obligation. Okay. All right, that, that that makes that's better. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, the ALTA six is for variable rates. Um, uh, if in order to get this endorsement, it has to be clear that that it, it, the um, the deed of trust secures an interest at a variable rate. Uh, Sixteen point one isn't used. Um, uh, it isn't used anymore. Uh, 16.2 uh, covers negative amortization, which is interest on interest, because it's a process which adds interest that is due and unpaid to the principal. Okay. Uh, and the ALTA 18. So the ALTA 18.0, it's when the tax number uh, does not include all the land described in the policy or it includes land that is not in the policy. Um, okay. And then 18.1 18 is used when there's multiple tax parcels and multiple uh, uh, tax numbers. Okay. Um, I'm gonna throw one that's not on the slide at you, but I think you, you, may, you may be able to address this to some degree. Um, and it's the ALTA 23, which is, uh, involves the coinsurance or the or, or the Me Too endorsement? Can can you talk to us a little bit more about that? What is there a certain point at which you know is there a specific dollar amount uh, that a lender would look to have you know to not have all the liability under one uh, uh, insurer? Uh, I, I I'm not really familiar with that endorsement because I don't generally do commercials that much. But it's 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 not really based on what the lender. It's more based on uh, levels of how much um, title insurers are willing to insure, or that's set by by state statute. Okay. All right. Good. Okay. Yeah. And I realized I threw that one to you kind of out of out of thin air as as well because just I have these kind of various questions floating around in my head too, and some of that has to do with coinsurance versus reinsurance, which I think a lot of uh, lenders will reinsure things too simply. For a, a little more comfort, uh, right? Yeah. It's, it's, so it's, it's yeah. It's, it's it's more set as how much the title insurer is willing to do, for, or, okay. or 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 if that state has a has a, has a particular limit. Okay. All right. Thank you very much, Stephanie. I sure do appreciate that. And and you know, um, the endorsements are are absolutely key to to uh, to your clients' needs, if you will. 
they have got to have the, for, for the title insurance policy to be complete and total and uh, and uh, and everything that they need. These endorsements are, are certainly uh, 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 must be had not only for the lender but for the uh, but for the owner and buyer uh, themselves. The Alta Land Survey does come into play as a huge evidence piece to the. Uh, to the policy um, uh, for owners and uh, and lenders, they want to assure that everything is as it is on the uh, on the land survey itself. Um, so I, I realize I think we've we've kind of wrapped up a little bit early, but I want to but I want to mention this. You know, we could go into full webinars regarding many of these, particular the the uh, Alta Nine, the comprehensive. That could take a full hour to really dig into. Um, the, so it, it, this was the point where we wanted to hit kind of the high level with some of the most common that are out there that you run into. Um, uh, Jeremy will be on, on standby on the back end and may have had some questions and comments that came along the way, but just know that there are, just from the Alta alone, there are 40 some odd endorsements that are what we'll call relatively common out there. Um, each of those 40 may in fact have, you know, five to six to eight to ten uh, sub settings depending upon the deal, depending upon the transaction, depending upon the type of property, depending on whether it is a, a leasehold or fee or what the, the, the transaction entails. So a lot of these we can dig into and have each and every one of them go, a, you know, a full, you know, 30 or 45 minutes per. So I hope we've hit some of the high uh, the high points uh, um, that, that that would at least come to come to be. And frankly, these were some of the key ones uh, that uh, that was presented to me as we wrapped up kind of my commercial versus residential you know policies and that transaction. So I'm hoping that these kind of touch base on the things. And if nothing else, threw out there enough information for you to be able to say, okay, I understand that, but I've got a question here. And then we can certainly address those um, uh, after the webinar, certainly via email, et cetera, and are certainly happy to do so. So, Jeremy, I realize we've wrapped up a little bit quicker than we uh, normally would, but I think we've gotten good information out there. No, David, a good pace. We, you know, we got you know, you know, 10 minutes or so uh, for a little Q&A time. Um, you know, Great insight on the uh, common endorsements that people could, could expect to uh, have their customers uh, request. Um, I do have a few few um, questions come in so far. Again, just a reminder, if you have any questions for either speakers, just submit them uh, through the question box and we'll, we'll see if we can get them answered. Um, Stephanie, you're going to hang with us, right, through this? Yes. yes. Oh, good. good. Wonderful. Thank you so much. All right. So, Stephanie, maybe one for you. Uh, Ryan asked if uh, we could touch on the ALTA 14 endorsements, the future advanced priority. I don't know if you uh, are familiar with that one. Uh, future advances. Oh, oh, I see. Let me uh, just uh, double check something so I'm reading it. I will say, you know, for agents or attorneys on the call, you know, if there's endorsements that, you know, you're not sure of, you know, why you, know, you have a client requesting them, oh, you know, work, work with your underwriter. <laughs> That's always a good yeah, thing. Oh, okay. absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, so this endorsement is when, usually when it's like revolving credit and the lender's concerned that their future advances, because it wasn't made at the time of initial closing, that that won't be, have the same kind of priority. And um, in terms of us issuing that endorsement, um, uh, as, as, as I, I believe we issue those endorsements as long as that issue that that future advance is uh, obligated and not at the discretion of the lender. Is obligated versus the request of the lender. Right. So the lender is obligated to issue the the, the future uh, uh, give the future advances, not that they have a a uh, discretion to uh, give the future advance. Oh, I say not a discretion to whether to or not. Okay, I understand. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, on a lighter note, Andrew wanted to know if the Big Ten will ever catch up to the SEC, David. So I might not a prayer in. Um, well, maybe. No, no, not going to happen. You know, Ohio State's. Um, you know, I, I get it. They're ranked up there. In fact, they just got our, our uh, quarterback that we just kind of threw off to the side, that Justin Fields. 
Um, but yeah, they've got a yeah, it's pretty good. All right. know, Michigan, Ohio State. If they had to play an SEC schedule, though, no, not a prayer. All right, uh, <laughs> we'll see. As people, we'll play. see though. Yes, I know we that part know. you too, there, Jeremy. Yeah, as people <laughs> know, I live in Columbus, Ohio. Um, <laughs> So some things, wow, questions are, are, are uh, popping in quickly. So if we don't get to your question, feel, um, actually I don't see your contact information. Shoot, shoot them to me and I will confer with Stephanie and then we will reply back via um, uh, an email or something. Okay, and I support the Go Bucks messages coming in. Um, a couple of, of uh, defining maybe some terms. Um, Stephanie, maybe what does interest rate swap mean? <laughs> so, again, uh, uh, and, and I'm, uh, maybe because I only know uh, the concepts very, because the way the banks use them, I don't understand how they do that. <laughs> so I, use, I know very the basics, which is, again, um, so, uh, so you can get a loan with a fixed rate or a variable rate, right? And so, uh, what what the if like a borrower wants a rate but they wouldn't necessarily get that rate unless they agree to the swap agreement because they wouldn't be as they're not as qualified um, um what they can do is that they agree to a rate and if if that interest rate the variable rate uh, goes up then the lender would have to pay the difference of that versus if that interest rate drops the the uh, from that rate whatever, not the fixed rate, but I guess it would be considered the fixed rate. Um, if, it, if it drops, then the borrower is liable for that. And, and so because the lender, if the interest rate goes up, the amount that they're giving out for this loan is higher than what the principal amount would be. Um, they're worried that they're not gonna, their, their deed of trust is not gonna secure the amount that they've been paying for the uh, in, uh, increase in interest rate. So, so the endorsement is uh, an insurance for that, for the, um, for the lender, that their deed of trust would cover those as well. To cover that change, okay, very good. Um, here's a question from, from Shelley. She uh, says a lender wants a condo endorsement and um, wants to know if they should also be issuing a location endorsement also. Well, the, the condo endorsement is to pretty much say the, the condo unit that is securing the, 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 the loan is actually a condo unit. <laughs> and the location is that the property is where it should be. So they're, they're, they're giving uh, coverage for two different concepts, but generally speaking, most lenders do ask for both. Okay. Okay. All right, just kind of uh, trying to weed through here a little bit. Um, just a reminder, uh, people are asking me where you can get the slides. Um, click on the handout section and just uh, click on the, uh, the hyperlink and should uh, download the PDF. Also, you'll be able to access um, tomorrow um, links to the recording and the PDF on Alta's website at alta.org forward slash title topics. Um, Maybe, maybe David, maybe for you, for you or, or Stephanie, um, when you mentioned survey in, in reference to Gores, <laughs> I've never heard of okay. it. Is this survey reference similar to a Texas land abstract survey where the land itself is described by large survey similar to meets and bounds descriptions in most other states? Yes, yes, it is. Um, just uh, again, the, the, the really what we do, the, the TLTA land survey is um, still going to be very, very similar to an Alta land survey. It will indicate all of the meets and bounds, uh, the easements, access, the right of way, et cetera, not just the boundaries themselves, but and still must mirror uh, the TLTA policy and the legal description that's, uh, that's uh, required at that point. So, yes. Okay, awesome. Uh, how close in time to the issuance of the endorsements, which are required to have a survey? So can the survey be dated? Um, and yeah, that's a pretty good question. There's a kind of a shelf life, if you will, but it's, but it really comes back to the comfort level of a, of the title uh, insurer, as well as the lender itself. We have seen them um, uh, shelf life be a, a year, if you will. 
Um, we have seen it though where some lenders and some titles have said, no, we know there's some activity going on in that area that may affect things. So, you know, a, a three month time period uh, may in fact be in place there. Pretty common question that we get though is, what is the shelf life of a survey? And certainly to, uh, to, to make the title uh, uh, insurer give them that warm and fuzzy, uh, they're going to want, uh, you know, it, it, it as recent as possible, you know. Um, Stephanie, do you have, is, is there some kind of a, uh, uh, something written in stone uh, as far as you're concerned? No, there isn't. I think that is what it is, warm and fuzzy. Yeah. yeah. And they want to, you know, an owner, maybe an owner's affidavit, you know, as well. Yeah. Um, Use owner's affidavit or inspection to follow up. So if the owner's affidavit and the, like the inspection shows the owner's affidavit is not all up on the up and up, then yes, we would probably require a new, new survey. But so there's no real shelf life. It depends on the property. Um, the activity on it, um, and, and um, any owner's affidavit inspections that might show something else. And when she says inspections too, she's pr primarily referring to a, a field verification that, that nothing has changed. And oftentimes, if something is a year old or so, then the lender and or title will say, okay, we're cool with it the way it is now. However, we would like for you to go back and simply verify that nothing has changed, perhaps update to a more current title commitment, which may not have changed anything much other than the date and, and a few things and perhaps a, uh, you know, a, a certification change. But sometimes a field verification is in fact required. A little more cost involved in us, even if we did the survey and the client requests that we uh, um, update it, then, you know, uh, it, do we update to new title? Are we doing new field verification? All those come into play as far as uh, cost and turnaround of, uh, of the survey too. Okay, um, warm and fuzzies are good things. Uh, uh, there you go. <laughs> a question about, uh, you know, kind of the language matching up, you know, for the Alta 25, does the statement on the face of the survey have to match word for word, or is it sufficient that it describes the same property, but in a slightly different way? No, we want it word for word. The word for word for title is absolutely the best. If it's not word for word for title, then we need to, um, so state on the face of the survey that this is not the, the exact same legal description. We need to, in fact, show the legal description that we believe that it should be. Now, in some instances, yes, that may re require a new recordation of that legal description. There may be some, uh, some other things that need to take place, but no, it can't be, okay, pretty close. Yeah, no, it has to be exact. Yeah, reference the previous comment, we need more warm and fuzzies. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, Susan wanted a little bit of clarification between the difference of priority versus knowledge. I'm not, I'm not sure uh, what that's in reference to, so maybe either one of you can tackle that. Stephanie, yeah, it's got to be you a little bit, I think. I'm not really sure what the question is in um, I, I, by by saying priority versus knowledge. I'm not sure what the question is. Yeah, I'm not sure. So, Susan, if you're still on, if you want to maybe clarify, otherwise we'll uh, we'll get to one more and then we'll wrap up. Uh, Sheila was hoping for maybe a little bit more color on um, the 33.06 disbursement endorsement. Oh. Um, so, so uh, mechanics lien coverage, uh, either it could be upfront or it could be incremental. So if you know that um, um, the construction loans are is for 500000 and it's going to be dispersed in five different uh, $100,000 um, disbursements, you could get upfront coverage, which means which is for the whole loan, um, or you could get it for um, uh, uh, based on how much the lender is dispersing. So the 33 is used in connection with um, incremental, incremental um, mechanics lien coverage. And, and you use it in conjunction with either the ALTA 32, 32.1, or the 32.2. So basically what it does is, is that um, after the lender has issued the, the, the next draw of the construction loan, they'll ask for a date down to the title insurer, and it increases their coverage. So as when they 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 they, uh, they uh, every time they give more money, they're getting more coverage too. 
Awesome. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, thanks, Debbie. Yeah. Fantastic color on these endorsements. So, so thank you. And uh, Susan did respond. So I don't know if you can do this in about 45 seconds. So the her priority versus knowledge, it was in regard to the future advance endorsements. Um, at, have that as an option, priority or knowledge. Uh, so, so I, I, I'm not, I still don't really understand the question, but in terms of the future advance, like I was saying was um, that the, in order to have priority uh, when you, so it, a lender usually for a regular loan um, will just have, they gave $100,000 on the closing date. And so they're getting a, um, a policy that secures their priority from that date, right? whether it's usually it's a you know first or you know it could be second or however many they're being insured for for that date but what, with the thing with um loans that re, like revolving line of credit you'll have a dealer trust that says that um that it's for you know you know up to two hundred thousand dollars but they might they only use you know a certain portion of that and then they're advanced some more after the date of closing so what the lender is concerned about is that like the uh, subsequent encumbrancers are going to argue you shouldn't have priority for the entire two hundred thousand dollars because they you only actually gave a hundred thousand on that date, and so um, that the future advance endorsement is to uh, give coverage to the lender that their deed of trust covers even those future advances that were given after the original date of closing of the loan, and you're allowed to get that. The way we assess whether or not we're willing to give that is if the deed of trust specifically identifies that it can it covers future advances, and there is nothing that allows the lender to, you know, decide on their own discretion whether or not they want to give the future advance. Okay. Does, All right. does that kind of clear priority versus knowledge? I think so. That helps a little bit. Yeah, that was uh, uh, Alta 14 and uh, 1406 priority 14.1 uh, knowledge, 14.2 letter of credit, et cetera, et cetera, and then the reverse mortgage. But I got it a little better. All right. Well, um, that will bring us to the conclusion of, of today's presentation. So uh, thanks everyone who uh, jumped on the call today. If uh, you missed parts of today's webinar, I think, so, think others in your office would benefit from listening. As I mentioned, a recording uh, will be available for replay uh, tomorrow at alta.org forward slash title topics. You'll also be able to download a copy of the presentation there as well. Um, if you're interested in more content about commercial tra transactions, there will be an education track uh, dedicated uh, to this topic uh, at Alta One, which will be held October 22nd through 25th in Austin, Texas. Uh, you can go to meetings.alta.org forward slash one for information on uh, the registration for that conference. Uh, in addition, if you want to mark your calendars now, uh, Alta will host its uh, third annual commercial network conference next year. Uh, this will be held in early June in Minneapolis. Um, looking ahead to our, uh, to our back to our webinars next month, we'll, ho we'll hold our third uh, compliance webinar of the year, and uh, this presentation will uh, have uh, a speaker from CoreLogic, who will be sharing details of their latest fraud, uh, the latest fraud trends affecting the market. So watch for registration for that webinar. And um, to wrap up, I need to thank Fidelity once again for sponsoring our Title Topics webinars. Um, also, like to remind everyone to make sure that their company is confirmed in the ALTA registry. Um, just because you're an Alta member or have a policy forms license does mean does not mean you're automatically in the registry. So ALTA.org forward slash registry for more information and, and check out check out if you're confirmed there. Um, again, thank you, uh, um, Stephanie, David, for sharing your insights and in, uh, into the uh, endorsement world and, and surveys. So um, thank you everyone for uh, listening and take care everyone. Thank you guys. Go SEC. Go SEC. <laughs> thank you, Stephanie. Okay, bye. Bye-bye.